Good evening to those of us in Japan and good morning to those of you in the UK. I'm Thomas Dabbs, Aoyama Gakuin University. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Sarah Olive from the University of York. This talk is sponsored by the English Literary Society of Aoyama Gakuin University. Aoyama Gakuin Daigaku e Bungakai. I need to time mark this recording also as taking place on December 3rd, 2020, the plague year. We are meeting in Tokyo from 1830 and in the UK from 930. We have members attending of our society and I know I speak for all of us when I say that we are delighted to have in attendance students and professors from universities throughout our region and throughout Japan. We would also like to extend the warmest welcome to those who have joined us from the United Kingdom and from York. I noticed some domains from York. So let's get on to Sarah Olive. Sarah was born in the UK and moved to Australia as a teenager. She majored in English at the University of Adelaide before completing her doctoral work at the University of Cambridge. She, is, she also took a second degree in Shakespearean studies at the Shakespeare Institute, University of Birmingham, where she now contributes to their programs as a visiting lecturer. She will speak to us tonight on the subject of Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis and perhaps some other areas of her research. Uh, it would be so happy to have her with us here in person. We are simply delighted to have her with us virtually. So Sarah, welcome, and please take the stage. Oh, thank you so much, um, Tom. And thank you for the very generous invitation to come and speak to you um, this evening. I guess I should say konbanwa for uh, your time uh, location. <laughs> okay, I am going to start by sharing my screen if that's okay. Bear with me whilst I um, just get my desktop going and hopefully you can tolerate the mess of my desktop for a couple of seconds just whilst I get the PowerPoint started. Okay, it is lovely to see so many familiar names but also uh, to see so many students who I probably haven't met in person, I guess, Tom, all of your students, although a few of you were, um, I think, around at university, maybe when I came a previous year. I am just fiddling to set up a little timer that I have that will keep me on track um, so that I leave plenty of time for us to have some discussion later. Okay, today we're going to talk about Venus and Adonis. I like to call it Shakespeare's least known greatest hit. Um, and we'll find out why. Okay, so just a little bit of context for this. Um, Tom has mentioned that we're in a plague year right now. And the plague closed London's theatres in 1593. So there are some similarities between 2020 and 1593. At least in the UK, we have not had uh, live theatre here really since um, March. So the closure of the theatres provided Shakespeare with the opportunity and incentive to write a long erotic poem, so a sexy poem, Venus and Adonis. And I think this fits nicely with uh, Professor Stanley Wells' argument that Shakespeare was a very clever businessman. He uh, would go on to be a shareholder in the theatre, not just a writer for it, not just an actor for it, we know that his father had been a glove seller um, in Stratford-upon-Avon. And so this kind of fits, this idea of um, the theatres are closed. I need to make some money. What do I do? I write a poem and I'll see if I can take it to the printers um, and get it printed, make some money that way. So it combined comedy, tragedy and beautiful poetry to tell the story of Venus's obsession with the handsome Adonis. You might see some comedy in, um, for example, some physical comedy, the image of Venus lifting and wrestling pretty much Adonis off his horse um, is part of the comedy there. The tragedy, obviously the goring of Adonis by a bull as we will get onto. Um, 
So these are just some of the ways those features are combined. The poem was Shakespeare's bestseller in print with 16 editions published before 1640. So that means that over half a century, there was a new edition published almost every other year. So it kept selling out and new copies um, had to keep being made. It was the most popular English poetry in the period, and it made Shakespeare famous as a poet before people knew that he wrote plays. Um, and I'm taking some of this from Jonathan Bates' uh, introduction to the poem in the Royal Shakespeare Company's complete works. Okay, we'll pop onto the next slide. Okay, the poem opens with a dedication to Henry Risley, um, I know that the pronunciation is probably hugely confusing there. It's a little bit like some of our towns like Peterborough, um, which really, if you were to pronounce it phonetically, would be Peterborough, but we don't say it like that. So Henry Risley was the Earl of Southampton, and this dedication precedes the poem. And in it, Shakespeare implicitly invites Risley to become his patron. So he hopes to get financial support from him. You can see the poem on the right hand side of your screens, but really the important thing, it's, it's quite long, it uses quite a lot of um, maybe obsolete uh, vocabulary if you're a language learner um, in Japan. But the important point to take away from it is that Shakespeare is saying, if you like this, I'll write something more serious for you. I will write something more profound next time. And maybe you can pay me for that. But if you don't like it, I'll leave you alone, I won't trouble you any further. You can also see here that Shakespeare describes the poem as the first heir of my invention. And so some critics have posed the questions, does this mean it was his first complete work as a writer? Does it mean his, it was Shakespeare's first solo work? So we know that Shakespeare had collaborated with other dramatists uh, to produce some of his early work. What's he kind of claiming here? I also want to kind of throw in a slightly cynical thing that maybe this is a ploy, maybe saying it's the first heir of my invention. So the first child, the first product of my imagination, maybe that is a little bit of a ploy to kind of say, this is very original, this is very new. You're getting the kind of, you know, my first efforts in this way. Okay, so I thought I would spend a little bit of time, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the poem already, just giving you an overview of what happens. So let's start at the beginning. Venus, the goddess of earth, falls in love with the beautiful human Adonis. She descends to earth to woo him, so to court him, to kind of um, date him, I guess. But Adonis has no interest in love, his only passion is hunting. And I thought for each of these slides where I explain the plot, I would include a little bit of quotation from the poem just to give you a sense of the language. I know um, that you've been fortunate this year to have Ben Crystal um, also involved with your university. And I think um, he's very keen on speaking and listening to the language of Shakespeare's plays. So here we go. Rose-cheeked Adonis hide him to the chase, hunting he loved, but love he laughed to scorn. Venus, like a bold-faced suitor, gins to woo him, the field's chief flower, sweet above compare. So here we're getting some of the idea of Venus's passion for Adonis. So Venus tries various strategies to detain Adonis from riding off to hunt. She puts her arms around him, she begs him for kisses, she tells him that she's been wooed by God. So kind of trying to get Adonis's jealousy working by saying, hey, I'm a really attractive goddess. You know, um, some of the best and most important gods have tried to woo me. And then she uh, also lists all the pleasures that she could offer him if he will reciprocate uh, her passion. She says, a thousand honey secrets shalt thou know. Here, come and sit where serpent never hisses. And being set, I'll smother thee with kisses. Sometime her arms enfold him like a band. And when from thence he struggles to be gone, she locks her lily fingers one in one. So I can demonstrate this. She basically 
does this, puts her arms around him, clasps her hands and won't let him go. Okay. The first time Adonis tries to escape Venus, his stallion runs off with a mare. So his male horse runs off with a female horse. Unlike his owner, his horse is keen to indulge in his desires. So we have a counterpoint here between Adonis, who is uh, what we might call standoffish, he is not interested in Venus or love generally, and his horse, who is very passionate um, and keen to get acquainted with this mare. He looks upon his love and neighs unto her. She answers him as if she knew his mind. So this is a description of the way that the horses are reacting to each other and very keen to get intimately acquainted. The second time that Adonis wants to uh, escape from Venus, he tells her he's leaving. Venus pretends to faint and thus manipulates Adonis into kissing her. On the grass, she lies as she was slain till his breath breatheth life in her again. Okay, I don't know exactly how to um, term this in Japan, but CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, right? When you have to resuscitate someone, maybe pumping on their rib cage and you're breathing into their mouth. Essentially, Venus pretends that she's passed out and that she needs some kind of medical intervention from Adonis. And so he puts his lips to hers and kind of tries to resuscitate her. She wakes up and goes kind of, ha ha, I tricked you, you know, let's uh, make out, let's do some more kissing. Um, and you can imagine Adonis is not very happy about this. Adonis tells Venus he plans to hunt a boar the next day. She tries to dissuade him. He has had a premonition that he will die in the hunt and she begs him to meet her instead. So a premonition is like, um, a bad feeling, a bad vision, um, something like that. He refuses and maybe he thinks it's another of her tricks like the fainting earlier. The next morning she hears his hounds chasing the boar and she's fearful for Adonis. She follows the sound of the dogs and finds them injured. Next, she finds Adonis body killed by the boar. Now I know on the bottom right hand corner of this slide, I know it's a warthog, but I could not find any pictures of a boar with kind of long enough or convincing enough tusks um, to illustrate that they might have um, gored, uh, so like stabbed into Adonis and killed him. So you'll just have to make do with the warthog um, and uh, imagine that. Okay, so having found um, Adonis uh, killed, she curses love. Venus cursed his love. From now on, she says, it will always be accompanied by jealousy, fear, and grief. Since thou art dead, lo, here I prophesy, sorrow on love hereafter shall attend. It shall be weighted on with jealousy, find sweet beginning, but unsavory end. Adonis' blood has fallen on the ground and a flower springs up from it. So a flower is growing out of the puddle of his blood. She picks it and she places it in her cleavage as a memento of him. She retreats to heavens with a broken heart. And we'll see this in the next slide. Thus weary of the world, away she hies and yokes her silver doves by whose swift aid their mistress mounted through the empty skies in her light chariot quickly is conveyed, holding their course to Paphos where their queen means to immure herself and not be seen. So we can hear um, in this stanza, some of the tragedy of the poem. It's not just that Adonis is dead, but also a kind of tragedy for the earth that Venus, this wonderful goddess is going to retreat back to the skies, back to the heavens, and she's going to immure herself. To immure yourself is literally to um, build a wall around yourself. That's the literal meaning of it. Figuratively, it means something more like she's going to hide away from society. She's going to kind of lock herself up um, and not socialize. There's probably a couple of other terms I should explain here. So when it says yokes, um, basically harnesses, reins in, um, 
basically the doves are like her equivalent of horses for flying through the sky in her chariot, which is a carriage. Um, and when it says holding their course, basically it's like putting your sat nav on, right? It is, um, they, they follow the route to Paphos in Greece, okay. So I just wanted to um, note a few quick poetry facts using uh, this slide. So we can see that um, the poem Venus and Adonis is written in six line stanzas. We can see that the rhyme follows what we call an ABABCC pattern. So I've marked up the rhymes with some color coding. You've got highs rhyming with skies, aid with conveyed, queen and scene. Um, and that last bit, queen and scene, forms a rhyming couplet. And you might be familiar with rhyming couplets from other poetry um, that you've studied, including if you've looked at um, Shakespeare's sonnets. Okay, so I want to get a little bit personal now. I want to tell you about how I discovered Venus and Adonis. I had actually not read Venus and Adonis when I saw a puppet production at the Royal Shakespeare Company's Swan Theatre um, by Gregory Doran's Little Angel Theatre. And Greg Doran is currently the artistic director of the Royal Shakespeare Company. I saw it in 2017 and I enjoyed it so much that I thought I would inflict it on my students for 10 whole weeks. So I thought I would teach it to my first year undergraduate students on the BA English in Education for a whole term. This is a little bit unusual in the UK. It's very often when we teach uh, English here that we will teach um, a whole novel each week or a whole play, or if we're teaching poetry, it might be that we teach a set of poems. So sonnets by Shakespeare or poetry by Keats um, in one week. So it might seem a little counterintuitive to take a poem and um, spin it out for 10 weeks, but maybe I'll be able to show you why I do it that way um, in the remaining slides. A couple of other things I would say about teaching it in spring term to my students. It seems a really good match, um, given the poem's romantic themes, its themes of courtship, to be teaching it around Valentine's Day on February the 14th. It's also quite interesting to teach it to first year students who've just arrived at university. And in the UK, they've usually left their homes. They've usually come to live in residential halls on campus, and they might be kind of making new relationships um, and kind of exploring issues about consent and the kind of ethics of relationships, perhaps for the first time. So hopefully they feel some interest in this. Okay, some kind of more um, academic rationales for teaching it. It's intended to uh, give the students some key skills in literary and theatre criticism that they can use throughout their th three years studying with us. And also many of my students intend to go on to become English teachers in schools. And perhaps it's giving them some skills for approaching poetry that they can use in the rest of their teaching career. So how do we study Venus and Adonis? We start with a read through of the poem in the first week um, and the students can choose whether or not they want to read. So if they're very shy, they may choose not to read, um, but I might ask them to pose some questions or to make some comments um, about the poem instead. And the rest of us, we will just take it in turn. Maybe we will read a stanza and then swap to the next person. Um, I usually arrange the chairs in a circle. We can't do this at the moment um, because of COVID restrictions, um, but perhaps we'll be doing it via a Zoom reading instead. So students can either read a PDF from David and Ben Crystal, who I mentioned before and who you're very familiar with, his Shakespeare's Words website, or they can bring an edition of their choice, so a copy of the poem that they have, maybe in a scholarly edition of Shakespeare. The interesting thing about doing this, about us all having different editions, is that we can talk about similarities and differences between these editions, um, similarities and differences that stem from different 
printing and editorial practices. And that's what I want to talk about right now. We have a little activity that I play called Spot the Difference. And you can play this yourselves at home. Um, maybe you want to note some of the differences in the chat function. Just in the interest of time, I won't ask you um, to kind of throw in those comments now. Um, but perhaps if you want to talk about them um, during the question and answer session, we can come back to this. So I asked the students to think about what's different in these images, what stays the same. And we can think about this in terms of the words on the page, the images or ornaments. Um, so an ornament describes, for example, on the top left hand image, you can see that there is a fancy border um, just made up of a pattern above the word Venus. We might get them to talk about the layout, how the lines of text are arranged, um, where the line breaks are and the use of font, for example. So what is written in big, bold font? What is written in smaller font? We might talk about the publishers and the place of publication. So you can see London here on pretty much uh, all of these um, images. Okay, there's another thing, another game of spot the difference that I play with my students. And um, this involves comparing on the left hand side of the screen, early modern English spelling of Shakespeare. And on the right hand side of the screen, modern, a modernized version from Shakespeare's words. Um, so you might notice, for example, a different spelling of the word Caesar in that top line. You might notice that palm has got an E added onto it in the left-hand column that we would not put there anymore. Other things that you might notice are what we call contractions. So in the second line from the bottom, being so enraged, you can see that the ED, um, the E has been replaced with an apostrophe to allow it to fit. Um, the meter of the line. And the other thing that you might notice is um, that you, uh, the piece of type, the letter um, for uh, B um, has been replaced by you. And this is very common in early modern printing. They're kind of uh, interchangeable or B isn't really established as a letter, a character um, in its own right at this stage. Okay, um, and you have very many professors here online who are absolute experts in early modern book history, early modern printing, um, and will be able to tell you so much more about this than I can. And maybe they can come in in the question and answer section to correct anything that I've gotten wrong there um, or to kind of pick up on other issues. Okay, so. Uh, just to kind of um, flag up uh, something else that we do apart from looking at the text and talking about the text of the poem, because remember, we've got 10 long weeks here together, me and my students. So apart from discussing these kind of textual and printing practices, we encourage the students to engage with radio plays. There's a wonderful, wonderful BBC radio play um, that was recorded, I think, in the 70s um, with the fantastic Dame Diana Rigg, who recently passed away. She's very famous to a lot of audiences for her roles in television shows like The Avengers, but she was also an actress for the Royal Shakespeare Company. And she gives a fantastic performance of Venus in this radio play adaptation. We also look at operatic and filmed performances. And these are available through the university subscription to various online platforms. But one of them that I'm going to talk about would certainly be available for you to look at, and I will tell you how. Okay, so the first production that I talk about is this one that really inspired me and got me interested in Venus and Adonis. It turned the narrative poem, which has lots of dialogue into a play in 2004, so perhaps we could argue that Venus and Adonis lends itself to adaptation into a play because it already has a lot of dialogue between Venus 
and Adonis, and the rest is kind of narration. So you can possibly cast somebody in the role of the narrator figure. And this is exactly what happened. I'm gonna read a little bit from a review, a theatre review in a newspaper or blog. It says, sitting on stage, a narrator, a narrator read the poem accompanied by a guitarist, while five puppeteers animated the story of the goddess's erotic pursuit of the young, reluctant hunter. Venus and Adonis were Bunraki style puppets, the former crafted out of supple foam and leather, the latter carved from wood. And it interested me there that the reviewer um, compares the style of puppetry in this production to Japanese bunraku. Um, and this also features a little bit in another review, which talked about the way that the fixed neutral faces of the puppets, so they were wooden mask faces, took on the emotions of the narrator's voice. So just by kind of tilting their head a little bit, they could um, change happiness into distress or shame or embarrassment. They could be sad or they could be comedic, funny. And I thought that this might be a little bit like no theatre. I'm not sure what you think. I'd love to hear whether mm, you're convinced by this idea of similarities between this Western puppet production um, and Japanese uh, theatre styles. Okay, and you can see in the picture on the left-hand side, puppets of Queen Elizabeth. Um, the Earl of Southampton is there in the middle. So Henry Risley, who the poem is dedicated to. And on the right-hand side, Shakespeare um, acted out the poem's dedication. Okay, um, I'm going to pop on to another production that I talk about with my students now. And this is from South Africa, the Isango Ensemble's Uvenus no Adisi, Adonisi. Sorry, my um, production, my pronunciation of African languages is much worse even than my Japanese. So this was staged at Shakespeare's Globe in 2012. This was London's Olympic year um, and part of uh, the, what we call the Cultural Olympics. It is still available for you to watch online at something called the Globe Player. So Shakespeare's Globe Player. Um, I think there is a small fee to watch it, perhaps something like three or four pounds. Um, and uh, you can pay a little bit more if you want to download it and keep it on your computer um, for the foreseeable future. It belonged to the Globe to Globe Festival that happened in that year. And this was a kind of challenge that the Globe set itself to host um, 37 of Shakespeare's plays in 37 different languages. And this South African production probably contributed massively to meeting that target. It included the use of Isizulu, Isizosha, Sesotho, Setswana, Afrikaan, and um, South African English, so a kind of world English, really. Um, it used many musical traditions. It drew on street rap, on showtime, jazz, marimba, chants, and uh, ululations, something you might um, associate with uh, perhaps tribes in Africa and tribal uh, culture. It aimed to represent the cultural diversity of Cape Town, and one of the really interesting things about this production is that it did not use one single actor to play Venus. It actually used seven different female actors in identical costumes. Um, you can see one of these Venuses stood at the front of the stage in the picture. But there was no attempt to make this seem like the same woman. They had their own hair. Um, they were different heights, different sizes. And there was no attempt to make them conform in their appearance other than just the um, leggings and the skirt and the top that you can see there. And I think there was something that this production wanted to do about suggesting that Venus is every woman or celebrating um, the idea that Venus, this um, ideal of beauty, 
can be represented by lots of different bodies. Um, and particularly it wanted to challenge um, myths around white beauty um, and a kind of absence of beauty um, among people with uh, different skin colors and skin tones. Okay, uh, let's head on to some of the other approaches that I use. So we've looked at two performances of Shakespeare. Maybe I still got six weeks left in this module. What do I do with those remaining six weeks? Well, they are dedicated to looking at the poem through a fresh lens each week using a different critical approach. So we might um, use a different literary theory like uh, feminism, post-colonialism. These are also sometimes described as critical theories. We might use a different writer, a different literary critic, a different scholar in each week. Um, and so the students, apart from having to read the poem at the start of term and maybe dip back into it when they need to refamiliarize themselves with different aspects of it, are expected to read a different journal article or book chapter every week. And I'm going to take a quick swig of water and then I'll tell you about some of these critical approaches we take. Okay. So one of the uh, approaches that we take is called source study. And what this involves is thinking about what Shakespeare read, how his reading influenced his writing, and how it is that scholars research this. Um, so we're interested in how Shakespeare appropriates and transforms his Ovidian source. So how does he transform Ovid's metamorphoses? Um, so Ovid writes um, this text, uh, we might describe it as um, a classic these days, and it's an anthology of Greek and Roman legend, and it describes transformations that are strange or fantastical. Um, human beings find themselves in extreme peril or passion, and they magically get changed into animals or insects, trees, rocks, flowers, Flowers is something that happens um, in terms of Adonis's transformation and so on. Okay, so we're interested in how he does this, um, perhaps via Arthur Golding's early modern translation um, into English of Ovid. And that's what's represented as the image on the right hand side. It's the frontispiece um, from Arthur Golding's um, version of Ovid, which a lot of scholars think is the source that Shakespeare um, worked with. Okay, we're interested in how the early modern literary culture of improving on existing familiar stories differed from the purported emphasis on originality in modern Western culture. So I think in modern Western culture, we're very quick to claim that a particular artist or singer or writer is, oh, they're so original. There's never been anything like this before. And this is the basis for their fame, for their reputation. But it's been suggested that perhaps early modern culture liked you to take a familiar story and add a new twist on this. Um, so for example, we might think about the way that Shakespeare reads and writes competitively. He competes with um, his forebears, the authors who went before him. And he is quite eclectic in how he engages with their materials. He expands in Venus and Adonis, for example, the women's roles. He takes the idea of eros or sex or lust from Ovid and complicates that by introducing um, some concepts of love or maybe the binary love versus lust that we talk about today. And he makes stories more ethically and intellectually complex. These are some of the differences we can see. But maybe some of the, uh, the vibe, some of the feeling of Ovid that is retained is um, Ovid's conception of Eros as a paradox, a mystery. This feeling between people is something that is um, it's unavoidable. This kind of chemistry happens between people all the time. 
but it is uh, maybe very um, ambiguous and unresolvable and can't be neatly packaged. Okay. So we also talk about why Shakespeare might have used these particular sources. Was he using this uh, source to impress the elite? For example, it has a Latin epigraph. Um, he retains or uses or puts there this uh, Latin epigraph, which we can talk about more in the Q&A if you want. Um, is it something about trying to sell more books to richer people that kind of leads him to engage um, with these sources. Okay, so these are just a few of the questions we ask. One of the approaches another week is to explore um, the text through the lens of feminism. And this builds on our students uh, because they're in an education department, they have a strong interest in social justice. So what we might also call something like, um, they're interested in equalities, in gender equality, sexual equality, racial equality, and so forth. We think about the misogynistic critical disdain for the poem. So this poem was neglected, particularly during the 19th century, um, what we might call the Victorian period, perhaps because of Venus's excessive body. I know I've used some complicated words here, corporality and sexuality, um, but this idea that Venus is too much, she is excessive, she has too much flesh, she presses that flesh onto Adonis in a way he finds uncomfortable. She has too much love, too much emotion. Um, and Elena Levy Navarro, who we read for um, this week, talks about fat phobia um, and talks about maybe ways that we can resist um, some critics' um, fattest attitudes towards Venus and maybe reappropriate that body and really enjoy the body because Shakespeare spends a lot of time describing Venus and Adonis's bodies. And maybe we can celebrate that physicality instead. And I've just put a little quotation in here from C.S. Lewis, who you might be familiar with as a children's writer of the Narnia series, but who was also a, a well-renowned scholar, literary critic um, based at Oxford University. And he described Venus as a very ill-conceived temptress, so much larger than her victim and physically a smothering. And he compared it to um, when he was a little boy, his aunts, his big sturdy aunts coming and grabbing him and hugging him and smothering him in kisses. And he really has quite a, a dismissive and um, repelled attitude towards Venus. Okay. Following on really from our discussion of uh, a feminist approach to Venus and Adonis, we also get into talking about issues of consensuality. So consent, um, and I've put a definition of this here as a clear agreement between people to engage in an activity, whether that's sexual or otherwise. And these notions of consent, they're quite interdisciplinary. They come out of feminism, gender studies, women's studies, human rights, law, and psychology. And there are probably other disciplines that you can think of that they draw on. So Venus falls short of modern understandings of consent. So some of those understandings you might be familiar with through the Me Too movement um, that was making headlines a couple of years back in her interactions with Adonis. She doesn't listen to Adonis repeatedly telling her he's not interested in her, he doesn't want to spend time with her. He doesn't want to kiss her. She physically restrains him, which in uh, many societies, many nations is against the law to restrain someone against their will. And I started to wonder whether it's possible that she bewitches his horse um, or that she kind of magically makes the mare, the female horse appear to distract his stallion um, and so that Adonis cannot leave because his stallion, his method of transport has disappeared. After all, she is a goddess, so maybe she's exercising some of her magical powers. She has greater power than Adonis. So there is what we call a power differential between um, Venus and Adonis that perhaps in this period would be more usual to see between an early modern man and an early modern woman. 
does she exploit that power differential to get what she wants? We would see that as problematic, particularly, I think, uh, in many cultures around sex today. And she deceives him into kissing her and other bodily contact by pretending to faint. And certainly within educational research departments and most social science departments and also hard sciences like medicine, um, deception is not something you should practice. You shouldn't trick people into doing things that they may not otherwise agree to do. So we explore this a little bit and this gets a very lively reaction from the students and they like to debate these issues of consent here. Okay, so a final approach that I want to talk about, you'll be glad to know I'm coming to uh, the end of my talk now, is to consider how the material history of Shakespeare's day shapes and is represented in the poem. This is an approach that you might call new historicism. So we're interested in exploring the Middle Eastern influences evident in Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis. And we use a particular article by Miriam Jacobson uh, the East as poetic commodity in Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis. So you might be asking, um, I don't know, this poem doesn't really seem very Middle Eastern. Where is Sarah getting these ideas from about this? Well, I would argue that um, the Middle East is present in the poem in the shape of Adonis's horse, who it several critics have described as bearing a strong resemblance to an Arabian courser. So some of you might be familiar with the phrase an Arab steed, um, a racing horse, a very fine and very expensive racing horse. We know that these horses um, were trading into the UK during the period. Um, there are some uh, descriptions by an author called Gervais Markham who writes about horses, what makes a good horse, advice on what to look for if you're buying a horse, kind of like the equivalent of car reviews today, right? So if you're gonna go out and buy a Toyota, you might read some reviews, find out which model you want to get. Um, and we think that Adonis's horse matches some of these descriptions of Arab steeds um, in early modern manuals for how to buy a horse. Another way in which the Middle East, um, or at least uh, kind of uh, places like Turkey, um, are maybe brought into this poem is through the flower into which Adonis is transformed. And um, some people have speculated that this is a fritillary, and I've pictured a purple and white fritillary in the bottom right hand corner there. Others have suggested it might be an anemone that it might be a tulip um, or that it might be a hybrid of some of these. And these were coming into the UK. They were very expensive to buy. They were being imported from Turkey. The good news is that because they are bulbs, like say, for example, garlic is a bulb, um, they could travel very well. You could load a big container of bulbs onto a ship and transport them. So both these horses and flowers were very valuable commodities in early modern England. And I mentioned previously that Shakespeare was a clever businessman, that he knew that these would be expensive items. And we might think about the economic incentives for Shakespeare, um, including these items in his poem. Does it give him a kind of cultural capital um, remember, he's dedicated this poem to an earl. Is he trying to kind of talk about the objects and include the objects that the noble people, the gentility um, in England at the time would be interested in? So they would find this poem maybe catering to their tastes very well. Okay, and we've mentioned already the incentives um, for Shakespeare to uh, write this poem in terms of the closing of the theatres due to plague. Okay, I think that that is everything that I would like to um, talk about in relation to the poem. Maybe I have skimmed over some si slides too quickly. Maybe some things I talked about too fast for you to um, understand or to fully read or engage with the slide. And of course, please, in the question and answer session, 
If you would like me to talk about anything in more detail, or you would like me to go back to something, I am really happy to do that. Um, but for now, thank you very much for listening. And Tom, would you like me to unshare for now? Just one more, I'm on, okay. Uh, Sarah, uh, what I would like you to do is to, uh, I, I am uh, giving my uh, applause uh, electronically, and I wanted to thank you so much for that. That is so interesting, and I am now ashamed that I have not paid more attention to this poem in my own career. You know, I'd be, the, the drama uh, draws us away. And we are, uh, and it's, it's a loss to us not to come back. And now I feel sort of redeemed that I paid, I think many years ago, I read Shakespeare's lyrical poems and, and so forth, but it was more as an academic exercise and I didn't stop and rest with it as you have done with your students. And this is just, this is a wonderful thing to, to uh, have uh, tonight because all of us are attracted to Shakespeare's drama and plays. And you've shown us how this lyric poetry, poem works into the dramatic and how dramatic poetry works back into the lyric poem and all of these features of how to, how to settle in with it and teach it over time. So thank you so much. And I'm going to stop recording now.